The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Hebrews 9, we're in a study called the New Covenant, and so we're looking at chapters 8, 9, and 10. So now we're working through chapter 9, we're looking at... <clears throat> The superiority of the blood of Christ, superiority in respect to the old covenant blood. And um, we're picking up at, of course, we started this in verse 11 through 15, and now we're down to verse 13. <clears throat> um, I guess we should go back to 12. For not through the blood of goats and calves, old, old, old covenant system, but through his own blood. Grasp that now. But through his own blood. Look, look at the word through. Not through this. Not through that door, but another door. Not through that door, but this door. It was through the blood of calves and goats, goats and calves. But now it's through a different door. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life, no man. In other words, another door. But through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all. The holy place is representative of heaven. Context. Once for all. Now he's talking about his death, isn't he? When he talks about the blood of Christ, he's talking about his death. And what it represented, the blood has become symbolic of what it represented. Once for all, having obtained eternal redemption, once for all, what came out of the once for all death, what came out of the once for all death that brought the blood of Christ into the system of redemption, it brought eternal redemption. That's the only way you're going to be redeemed after Christ dies on the cross. Now, that's historical Christology rather than prophetic. For if, uh, verse 13, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers, sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify, watch this now, for the cleansing of the flesh. That's the most the blood of calves and goats could do. You understand that? How much more? That brings us the superiority of the bloods compared. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse, that's, that's that same word, cleanse, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. Okay? Uh, verse 15. And for this reason, the blood of Christ, once for all, eternal redemption, without blemish, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant. In order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So we found the word eternal twice. Eternal redemption is synonymous with eternal inheritance. <clears throat> so we're going to talk tonight about the superiority of the blood of Christ out of this text. Now, sometimes people who visit us either by automobile, by Internet, doesn't understand why I teach the way I teach. They say, you know, we like what you have to say, but you teach way too much. <clears throat> say. And I, I want, I, so every once in a while chance, I get a chance to talk to somebody about what do you mean about too much? Is it 
too long? Well, yeah, kind of, but well, I understand that. We're used to having commercial breaks every, you know, 30, 30 minutes. You know, it used to be you had a short commercial break. Now the commercial breaks as long as the whatever he's watching, isn't it? The other night I counted, I counted eight on one. Eight advertising in that period. I knew more about that than I did about the program I was watching. I went, I'm going back to music. But anyhow, I'll tell you why. I'm going to tell you why I teach the way I teach. And I've been teaching this way since I was introduced to it in 1968. In 1968, I was introduced to a system of teaching that absolutely revolutionized my own spiritual growth. Maybe if I hadn't experienced it in my own life, I may not. If I had just been theory, I don't know, I would have picked it up. I didn't pick it up in seminary. I picked it up in real life experience. So what I was taught was ice, that you should approach a scripture isagogically. In other words, how does it fit into the great scheme of the word of God in, in history, biblical history? <clears throat> bring it into the relevancy of whatever generation you're teaching. That's the I. And the C is categories. When you teach somebody, every, your life is lived out in categories. What you're going through. People talk, what are you going through? Well, I've, I'm going through migraine headaches. I'm going through a divorce. I'm going through job change. I'm going through this. I'm going through that. And what they want to know is how to get through it. And you, you can't give them just one verse often. Uh, you can't even give the gospel like that. I mean, it takes several verses to, com to completely go through a gospel presentation. And so categories are really essential because that's the way we live our life out. <clears throat> that's why people, that's why there's a lot of counseling going on in churches. The other, and then the E stands for exegeting. The exegeting is really important because what does the Bible really say? What is God really telling us? And sometimes in the translation from one language to another, some things are lost in it. <laughs> and so it's, it's important that it is important for me that I ice teach. So I ice teach. But I'm going to tell you what, what, what put this in my soul so I'll never de deviate from it. What, what it was, was a passage of scripture in 1968 that grabbed my soul. I studied it, studied it, studied it, and lived it, and I found it to be an absolute. It's 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 16 and 17. And I, why I teach the way I teach is based on that passage of scripture. It absolutely revolutionized my life, not just as a Christian, but as a, a minister a minister of the word of God. Here's what it says. And you know this, but it says all scripture. And that's all I do is teach scripture. I don't teach out of magazines and books. And as I, I just, my, my only book, I teach out of the word of God. It says all scripture is God breathed. In other words, it's been designed to inhale and exhale in your life. You got to take it in in order to put it out. That's true with all books, isn't it? I mean, you have to learn something and then apply it, and then you keep your job. If you don't, then you lose your job. <laughs> so it says all Scripture is inspired of God, and then it says, and is profitable for. And this is what gr grabbed my attention. Now, this is Scripture. If you approach the Scriptures properly, the, pro pro the Scriptures will do the rest of the work. And I was all for that idea. I went, ho, oh, I don't have to walk behind people and clean up after them. I went, whoa, well, that's revolutionary. And it says, here's what the scripture will do if it's properly taught. It says, it will teach you. It will rebuke you. It will correct you and will train you in righteousness. Now, buddy, that's a living counselor. It will teach you. This is the scriptures. It's not Ron Adema. It's the word of God taught properly by Ron Adema. It will teach you. It will rebuke you. It will correct you. 
it will train you in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped in every good work. So I teach the way I teach because I want the scriptures to be delivered in such a way that the scriptures will do the rest of the work. So I don't have to follow behind you with a, a shovel. Clean up your messes. The scriptures will do it, right? What will the scriptures do? Teach you, rebuke you, correct you, and train you in righteousness so that you can be adequate within yourself to live your life unto Christ. So that's the reason I teach. And if it's, it's too much, then, you know, you'll grow into it. I did. I remember going in the first time. It was quite a bit. But then uh, my appetite kept growing. And what was the first meal was too much. Right? After about the 26,000th meal, I was on to a schedule. Anyhow, that's the reason I do what I do. Uh, so, you don't need to call me anymore. Or write me letters on it. Uh, just pass this information around. It'll be fine with me. That's why I do what I do and why, what, why I do what I do. And I've been doing it since 68. And I'm not about to change. <laughs> I'm not about to change. Because I don't want to do all the work. I want, to, I want to cook the meal and bring it and serve it and then go home. And it's supposed to do its work. If you take it in with positive volition, it's supposed to do its work. It says all scripture. It didn't say all preachers. <laughs> Thank God. So let's have a word of prayer. Then we're going to look at this thing uh, in a way that I feel it's important to look at it. Now, the issue for us in Bible study is classroom etiquette. You're in, if you're a believer, if you believe Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, that's called the gospel. It says, Romans 1.16 says, the power to save you is in the gospel when you believe it. And therefore, you're saved by grace, not yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works. Now, once that happens, because we live under the new covenant, the Holy Spirit indwells your body and becomes the dominant player in your life. And listen to me. If he's not the dominant player in your life, you don't understand what the new covenant Christianity is all about. Because you should read John 14, 15, 16 where he discussed before he goes to the cross the importance of the Holy Spirit. When he leaves the earth, the Holy Spirit is going to come back and he's going to do phenomenal work inside your life. And you should be aware of that. Well, you can't study the Bible in carnality. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't, you can't. Study it in carnality. How would you know if you're in carnality? Evidence of personal sin. You can't study the Bible. You can't, you can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. But you can in spirituality. So you need to understand that. So what's, what, how do I recognize it? Personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins. But you would have awareness of it. There would be conviction about it. And what should you do? You should confess it. First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess it. Who do you confess it to? To the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess it to the Father. The Son will take care of it. He's already, your sin has already been paid for. The cleansing is the issue. Listen, you missed it. First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That's continuation of verse 7. In the Christian life by confession. That's not how you get saved. That's how you become spiritual. When you're in carnality, to get out of carnality and back into spirituality, you confess your sin. And you do it not 
you do it every time you're aware of it, then you confess it. It puts you back into a spiritual program. Father, we're so thankful today for the love of mercy and grace of God that came through Christ to our life. We're thankful to be part of the new covenant believers of grace, not law. We look tonight at the superiority of the blood of Christ of the new covenant. What a magnificent day to live in biblical history is the church age. I pray tonight, Father, as we look at the subject matter of this out of Hebrews 9, that you would encourage our hearts, set them on fire for Christ, that we might not only talk the talk, but we might walk the walk, to be a great ambassador for Jesus Christ with the gospel of reconciliation. Uh, the unbeliever who is alienated from God, whether he knows it or not, it is by position at Adam. He can be rescued from that position. He is dead, he is blind, he's condemned, and he can be released from that. When he believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, he can be rescued and transferred into Christ, into the kingdom, in time and eternity. What a magnificent program, and what a magnificent message each of us have to carry to the world. We pray tonight, Father, as we look at the superiority of the blood of Christ, what an enormous thing this is for our life in Jesus' name. Amen. Our lesson text is really, and if you look at verses 11 through 15, I want you to look them in your Bible. Look at verse 11 through 15, because that's only three Greek sentences, and that's really important. Three Greek sentences. Verse 11 and 12 is a Greek sentence. Now, you, you know the Bible wasn't written in chapters and verses it became that and so you pay attention to how this thing rolls out verse 11 and 12 is a greek sentence verse 13 and 14 is greek sentence and verse 15 is a greek sentence there are three greek sentences a sentence is a com is a complete thought on something all right so we got three and they're going to one is going to spin off to another in other words they're this part of the conversation is going to lead to this, to this, right? That's the way the scriptures are laid out. One is going to lead to another, to another, to another. Okay? That's how it's going to do. Okay? So, <clears throat> verse 11 and 12, 13, 14, and 15. Three Greek sentences. Now, this is important to our lesson because in 913, which is where my lesson text is, look at verse 13. In verse 13, thanks, Rick. In verse 13, look at the word for. Now, remember, verse 11 and 12 are a sentence. Verse 13 is a sentence. Verse 13 begins with gar, right, which is a trailer hitch, okay? It begins with a trailer hitch. This is important, 13 and 14. So it, ver, verse 13 and 14 are connected with verse 11 and 12. Agreed? That's a trailer hitch. It's a, it's a conjunction there. That's a, We use it as a trailer hitch. Uh, this is important to our lesson because verse 13, the, ne the second sentence opens with gar, used to further explain the first Greek sentence. And with it, the superiority of the blood of, of the new covenant and the eternal redemption of Jesus Christ over the old covenant. You understand that? So let me go back because now we're looking for something. We're looking for markers. So let's go back to verse 11 to 12. Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come. He entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, to say, not of the creation. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Right? Now watch what he does. For, that's a trailer hitch. What we're going to say in the next sentence comes off from what we just said. And with, with to further, this gar, this word for, is to further to further explain something that has just been stated. Are you with me? 
And what has just been stated is about the blood of the old covenant, uh, goats and calves, right? That was important until, and it was important because they pointed to the coming of Christ who would fulfill it. And so, it, and so the writer says, so when we get to verse 14, he says, for if, that's a first class condition, that if is a first class condition. See, that's one of the things you don't know in the English because if is if. And you have to have a lot of conversation if. But this is a first class condition. There are four of them in the Greek language, and they, they, get, they, they narrow the idea down for you. This is a first class, it means, and it's true. Now, listen. Uh, 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 a conditional clause has an if and a then. We call the if the apodosis, and the then is the apodosis. Okay? So, if, if what's true in the if is true in the then, unless there are negative identities. So here's what it says. For if, and this, this is a trailer hitch, further explaining what has just been stated, which he contrasted to two, two bloods, the old covenant blood and new covenant blood. If the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer, heifer and a heifer, Sprinkles those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. That's point A. And and what's the and and it's a first class condition, and so we should say, and it does, and it did. That's how it worked under the old covenant. Oh, see, you're missing that. When the blood was offered under the old covenant, what did it cleanse? Flesh. Verse 14, this is, the, this is part B of this sentence. How much more, in other words, this is where you get the idea of greater or superior. How much more, how much more, now, we're, now that has introduced us to the uh, apotheosis of what's true then how much more true with the blood of Christ, then how much more true is the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself, that's voluntarily, that's that John 10 idea, voluntarily he offered himself, offered himself. Somebody didn't pick, go and pick out a lamb and say, this is the right one to use, bring him and kill him. He didn't have a vote in it, right? His vote was that, the, the handler of it, he had to be without blemish and spot. If he was, uh, and, and bred certain, the kosher kind of concept, then he was in. I mean, he might have said, bad, but it didn't work. This is a bad deal. But the, how much more? Now, let's, now we're paying attention to how much more. How much more with the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. He offered himself without blemish to God. This is what it means, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, that's what that means. How much more? Well, here's how much more. The blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself. See, listen, the blood of Christ is, comes, comes because he offered himself a sacrifice for our sin. It was the, the blood is symbolic, not literal. Do you not understand that? Well. Without blemish to God, how much more? There's one part of it. How much more? Well, the blood of Christ, he offered himself a sacrifice for our sin. And not only our sin, but the sin of the whole world. Right? John 1, Behold the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Uh, 1 John 2, 2. He is the propitiation for our sin and not only ours, but the sin of the whole world. 
a big deal. I mean, one guy dies one dead on one hill on one day. It's good enough to take care of all the sin forever of the human race. <clears throat> Talk about a heavy day at, at, the, at work. Now, here's the second part of this. How much more? How much more? The blood of Christ, because he voluntarily gave it up. The, the, the son of God became the lamb of God. I get so crazy at Easter. Dealing with eggs and chickens. When we ought to be dealing with lambs. This drives me nuts. But anyhow, that's just a pastoral thing. How much more? Here's the second part. How much more? The blood of Christ who offered himself voluntarily without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience. The conscience is part of the soul. The Old Testament never touched it. It was never inside. It was always outside. There's a body, soul, and spirit. One's outside, two are inside. Christ dies for the soul. What shall a man exchange for his, what shall a man exchange for his soul? Let me tell you what one man did. He exchanged it for ours. Cleanse, cleanse, that's a key word. Cleanse, we had it, we had it in the first sentence. Now we got in the second sentence. These are markers. We had blood in the first sentence. We got blood in the second sentence. We have cleanse in the first sentence. We got cleanse in the second. The first sentence is old covenant. Second is new covenant. And new covenant, both both the offer, the sacrifice, the blood, the birth, everything is superior. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. Okay? So, and then 15, the 15 is the third sentence. And look how it starts. This is the third sentence. And for this reason, that's another trailer hitch, right? We're piggybacking an idea in these three sentences, which are verse 11 through 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed on the first, Adam's sin, those who have been called under the new covenant may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And you got to pay attention to in order that. See that word, in order that since a death? Well, that's hopos in the Greek language. That's hopos plus a subjunctive. In order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions which were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive is the subjunctive. All the way down there to get to a subjunctive. In order that was put there so that we could go when we got to that you may receive one of this. That's what that was. That whole pass. That whole pass has punched you with that whole information to drive you to the subjunctive mood. It's whole pass plus the subjunctive in the Greek language. Here's what it says. In order that sense of death, he who volunteered himself and gave his blood, gave his life for our sins, he who knew no sin became ours. And, and for this reason, he's made a mediator. In order that, he's the mediator now, in order that sense of death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive. There you are. All of that so that we can receive the promise not only of eternal redemption, 
eternal redemption, which we've been, which we've been given, but eternal inheritance. And that's just a little bit. That's part of the 50 things you receive in salvation. You can never lose in time and eternity. Why? Because Christ secured it for you. And if you are in Christ, you are, if you believe the gospel, you've got it. <laughs> oh, this is too good. Oh, this is too good. Three sentences all linked up with enormous theology of the new covenant. This is new this is New Covenant theology, uh, lights out. So, see, I'm under a command to first teach the scriptures and then take it out into your life. See, I'm commanded to first teach the scriptures. What does the scripture say? You understand that? I can't just open the trip passage up and so and then run off somewhere with it. I'm not, I don't have that privilege. I, I I can't do that. Under my mandate, I can't do that. I have to do what I just did in order for you to have a grasp of what I'm about to tell you. Because my points now are going to come off from what I just told you. I'm going to try to bring it down into everyday living, what it means in your life. I mean, this is high drama theology. Now, I'm going to try to bring it down to some kind of practical working, but it has to be practical based on what I just taught. If it doesn't, then it don't jive. So why do I teach on the, why do you go to such lengths in the scriptures, Ron? I don't see how I could go less than what I just did. I should go deeper, but I'm not sure that people, who, maybe you could, but listen, the majority of the people listening to me tonight are not sitting in my presence. They're on the internet somewhere. By, by in my presence. I don't mean. So, but I, but you have to understand, I have to do what I have to do. <laughs> Whether people like it, don't like it, whether they'd rather stay home and watch the basketball or whatever they want to do, that's their business. That's, that's okay with me because I got to do what I got to do. I'm accountable not to you. I'm accountable to the Lord first. Accountable to you second. So we, we have this all laid out, and I, I've tried to lay some of it out on the scriptures to help you, and hopefully you've gone along and paid attention to some of the key figures. There are enormous links in here of the Greek. There are certain links that are really important. I tried to show you the, the big ones and not all the the minute stuff that's important. I, I didn't give that to you. I don't want your eyes to roll over. You've had a busy day. I understand that. I mean, I've caught you on the, you know, at camp they used to give me the kids after they had just played, just ate, eaten, they gave them to me for my hour of Bible study. And that's okay. Listen. It's okay. I'm the man. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Now, here's another thing. Here's another thing. Did you notice a verse? Did you notice verse 14 has a question mark? Did you notice that? Okay. My good Greek students know. They know. So if there's one on 13, what else is included in that? Verse 13, agreed? If there's, a, if there's a question at the end of verse 14, that it includes 13, agreed? It's, it's a Greek sentence. All right, that's important. That's really important. And so I thought, you know, they, they might miss that. So let me write it down. The second Greek sentence consists of a first-class condition with a rhetorical question. You know where you get the answer to a rhetorical question? Inside the scriptures. You know, when you ask somebody a rhetorical question, you're trying to pull the answer out of, their, out of themselves. 
Where were you last night? You didn't get home at 11. And usually the guy that asks the question already has got a pretty good idea what the answer is, so you better give me the truth. At least that's the way my mother approached me. Well, you didn't lie, dare lie to her. I mean, I was a grown man. I still didn't. I was afraid she could still get me somehow or another. I was a grown man. I don't lie to my mama. Jeez. Well, anyhow. See, and, and that's important. And then again, there are other things like how much more, and for this reason, I tried to show you those things that are key links to understanding that text. So I want to look at five things tonight about the superiority of the blood of Christ because that's why we've come. Hopefully we've come to study the scriptures and then get some get some walking shoes on. <laughs> Try to get your walking shoes on you. So here's the first thing. Jesus Christ is the only mediator of the new covenant. He is the only mediator of redemption. Of the, uh, we live in a day when he is the only mediator. Now, he tried to prepare his disciples for that when he said, you know, John 14, 16. You know, John 14, 16, is, it's a magnificent. I used to quote that thing, had no idea where he was when he spoke it even. But when you go back and look at John 13 through 17, he's in the upper room discourse, and he's in a heavy dissertation on, the, on him leaving and the Holy Spirit coming and issuing in the new covenant age of the church. Holy macro. That John 14, 6, it takes on a whole new light. I am the way, the truth, and life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. Now in the theology, when that works out in theology, that statement in theology, he's got to go to the cross. He's got to be buried and raised from the dead to become the mediator of the new covenant. He is the only mediator of the new covenant. There is not two different ideas on this. You can go to 15 different churches, 15 different, but listen, the word of God only has one. He is the only way. It is through him, through the fact that he died on a cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, called the gospel. That's how you get in. You don't get in any other way. You can go to church. You can sing, do Lord, until your eyes fall out. Ain't going to get you saved. But listen, in the silence of your own heart, you can say, I believe that I, get, I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Upon that, I believe. He says, upon that belief, you are saved in time and eternity. What a great split-second decision that was. Whew. He's the only mediator of the new covenant because of the superiority of the blood of Christ, which he voluntarily gave himself up for. He became the, he voluntarily did this. And his great struggle was he was going to be separated from God, whom he'd never been separated for any time ever. I mean, we separate from God in a heartbeat. We, we jump in and out of a relationship with a hundred times a day. Don't even give it a second thought. Until you hit spiritual maturity and you go like, like that's not good. I'm not going to do that anymore. But it takes spiritual maturity to be able to have the capacity to be able to catch that thing before, before it slides any deeper into your soul. That bad idea, that bad decision, that anger, that oh, it's me, why me business, that whining. I call it whining. That's why I'm not very good in counseling. <laughs> I call that whining. I just want to take my hanky out and <laughs> instead of give it to him, I just want to tap him a little bit with it. Listen, for this reason, he is the, for this reason, for this reason, for this reason, he is the mediator. For this reason, when you go back and you look at verse 11 through 15, it tells you wh what that reason is. What is the reason that he, well, what makes you, pastor, what makes you think that he's the only way? I believe the Bible, strange as that sounds. <laughs> 
for this reason, he's a mediator for the new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions which were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. We, when you read uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 24, it's going to tell you it again. He's going to say he's the mediator. When you go to 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6, he's going to say he's the mediator. You know what's happened? It's become a, a central message of the theology of the new covenant. Jesus Christ is the mediator. You, nobody gets to the Father except through him. It was he on the cross. If you don't go to the cross, listen, if he didn't go to the cross, he didn't go to heaven. Think about that for a while. He understood that when he went into Gethsemane. This is what the writer says. He has to offer himself on the cross to go back to the holy place. He has to go there. That was his mission. That's why he came into this world. He came in. He must do the Father's will. If he doesn't do the Father's will, he's in deep trouble, Adam. There is no other way. And listen, there's no other way for you either. You're not going to heaven any other way than through Jesus Christ. His atoning work on the cross for your sins, buried and raised to give you life everlasting. You're not going. Don't people lie to you. If you think you're going, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're absolutely 100% wrong. Don't be dumb. Before you say, well, it's my choice, I'll do what I want. I'll take the consequences. You'll take the consequences, but you, before you drop out of here, you ought to read Luke 16. Read about the rich man of Lazarus, that tough guy. If you want to be God, list you'll go. Well, I guess I'm not as tough as I thought it was. Listen, you're never as tough as you think you are. In my best day going to the gym, a little girl came up and put her arm there, and I armed wrestled and I thought she was going to break my arm. I didn't do that anymore. Arm wrestle a girl in the gym? What were you thinking? I should have done it in great privacy where everybody couldn't talk about it. And weren't any excuses either. She put my arm down and hurt me. Second, superiority of the new covenant blood cleanses. Works because of the cleansing work of Christ. The superiority of the new covenant blood is the cleansing of Christ. Because he offered his own blood for the sin of the world. This is brought up in the first church conference in Acts 15, 9. When it says, he made and he made no distinction between us, the Jew, and them, the Gentiles. Cleansing, same word, cleansing their hearts by faith. A moment ago, oh, now listen to me. A moment ago, the writer of Hebrews said, the cleansing of your conscience and then explained what the cleansing would do for you if you if you stayed and studied it would cleanse your conscience from dead works of the law come on now it would because that's what we're talking about in context are we not talking about the old covenant versus the new covenant would cleanse the blood of christ would cleanse your conscience from the old covenant, dead works, which was designed to clean the cleansing of your flesh, dead works, dead works now. Now they're dead works. Before they were living, now they're dead. Cleanse your conscience from dead works. Watch this now. To serve a living God. -ah. But at the church conference, they expanded the idea, didn't they? They talked about the cleansing of your heart. See, we're talking about internal, new covenant, internal cleansing, 
and the old covenant was that because it was a work system. There you go. So once you get, listen, I can't tell you how many pastors that I have dealt with over my years who married a woman who was a, a believer, a spiritual person, he thought, who was work oriented, got married, and he, he was a word oriented pastor like I am. And they stayed in conflict all the time because he wanted her to get in the word and she was into work. And they stayed in conflict all the time. He, she wanted him to be more engaged in works and less in the word. He wanted her to be engaged more in the word and less in works. And they had a constant battle because he's a word man. That's stuff you don't even think about. And I say to them, your job is to coach your wife up. That's your job. Not demand it of her. You have to do like you have to do everybody else. You got to teach her up. I mean, you can sit at the coffee table and talk about theology in her, in her, her terms and ways. You don't have to go, right? You've got to bring her in. You've got to bring her in. At some point, she will balk and maybe not come in. But your job, your job is to coach her up. But she came out of a work system, not a word system. We find that often in our church. There's conflicts between people who come out of work systems. You're a word system. And they're, listen, just relax and be a process. It's a process. They may come around. They may never come around. The guy, the gals who don't, then their husbands take take a real whip in as far as ministry because the, the church is always asking them, how come your wife don't come to bible study she's not sick she's not disabled i mean why does she come to bible study with the rest of us he, he can't say to her well it's not that she's not positive she's just more work oriented she thinks a little bit of bible and a whole lot of work is what makes you spiritual she doesn't realize it's the other way around What are you going to do? Well, tell you what you're going to do. You can work on your marriage. That's what you're going to do. Even if you have to leave and go work at Walmart for a while. Apparently, they take everybody to become, become a place to go, I guess. Uh, Hebrews 9.14, how much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. See, that was the big war, without blemish. I mean, if he goes against the will of God, you know what he's done? He's got blemish. Can't go against the will of God. He has to be, listen, he, listen to me. Here's the one. Second Corinthians uh, 5, 21 says, he who knew no sin. Think about that. 33 years. It doesn't go against the will of God. Holy catfish. Right? Do it. What, Al, I could ever. No, I mean, yeah, ever. I mean, who does that? The son of God. <laughs> well, I'm a son of God. Well, okay, then work on it. Right? I, you know, I'm a work in project. Uh, what they say? A work in. There you go. Apparently, I haven't learned that yet, have I? Who gave himself, Titus 2.14, who gave himself, who gave himself, Nobody took his life. You know, you can't blame the Jew. You can't blame the Romans. They just roll. They were role playing, right? Under the great picture of God. You can't blame God. There's nobody to blame because it was all a good thing, wasn't it? Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify. That's the word cleansing. That's the word cleansing. Notice I put, put it in the Greek so you can see it. And to purify for himself a people and to cleanse a people for himself, for his own possession, zealous of, of good deeds. Or 1 John 1, 7. People often, you know, we quote 1 John 1, 9 around here all the time, but it works off from 7. If, which a third class condition, maybe, maybe you will, maybe you won't. In other words, it requires volition. If, maybe you will, maybe you won't. If we walk in light as he himself is in the light, 
then we have fellowship with one another. That's mega plus the genitive of fellowship with a plural. That's a genitive plural masculine. And the blood of, in other words, you're, listen, here's what this says. It's based on verse 5. This is, ba fellowship is based on verse 5. This is an a priori argument out of 1 John 1. Verse 5 is the thesis of the, of the whole thing from 1 John 1, 5 through the second chapter, verse 2, is a a, a, a a priori argument in the Greek. And it works off from a general thesis and then goes into uh, specifics. The general thesis is in verse 5, which is fellowship. What God is light, in him there is right. Is that what it is? Right? If we walk in the light, then we walk in fellowship. Right? We walk in darkness, then we, right? Then we're out of fellowship. I'm not out of salvation, but I'm out of fellowship. So that's the premise. And then he goes through, he sets up a whole thing. Every, every if in the a priori argument of 1 John 1 is a third class condition, just like I just gave it to you. Those who've gone through that book know that with me. And so here's what he's saying. Here's what he's saying. Here's the first responsibility you have. Be sure you're in fellowship with God so that you can bring the fellowship, the spiritual fellowship that you have with God into relationship with other people. That's the plural. Be sure that, right, and listen, I've told this many times, because, you know, I've been with you 44 years. You've heard everything I've got to say a hundred times. But listen, when I first learned this concept, that I have to be in fellowship with him and that I, I have to, I have that fellowship relation through the blood of Christ that's extended to me. When I get out of fellowship, I get into carnality. My way back is to confess my sin in first John one nine, because verse seven, the blood of Christ works to put me back in verse five. Confession of my sin in verse nine works for me because the blood of Christ in verse seven puts me back into fellowship of verse five. Are you with me? So, I would, you know, you know, I might be, I might get in a conflict with my wife and be out of fellowship for a day or two, may, maybe longer, just depends how, how the thing went, whether she short shirted, cheated me or something, you know, where you put the, okay. All right. Just wondering if anybody else has had that. It's been so long ago, you can't remember. Well, anyhow. So, I mean, I, that thing would go, I would go like, look, I should, I should be able to get back quicker than this, but I couldn't. I go, nah, right? You know, I was like, walk around like a bulldog for a day or two. <clears throat> and I went, listen, this is miserable. And so I got to thinking, well, that's what, this is what Bob means by rebound. The whistle blows t and the referee takes time out. So I, I, you know, I understood that the way sports work with if a referee's got a whistle, then when he blows that, everything stops and and the, a penalty is a, and then we go back to the game. So I went and got a whistle. Oh, no. Yeah, this I got a whistle and I, I I explained to Jane what this was and how we're going to work the game and was she part of it? And she went like, I guess. And so we put it. I put a I put a nail in the in the wall and I put the whistle up there in the den and whoever got out of fellowship would run and blow the whistle and meant time out we would go to our separate quarters we'd get back into fellowship with God and we'd come back and talk about it well it I, I didn't pay any attention to the fact that I had four little kids I forgot that we were part of a bigger household with problems than just us two. So we started out. That worked pretty good. I mean, we could get it right away. And then it got really funny because sometimes we had it at the same time. We both running for the whistle. <laughs> and the kids would watch this go on. We'd blow the whistle. And then we, finally, it just got to be funny. Right? I mean, mad dash for the whistle, blow the whistle. And, and the kids going like, what's going on, Dad? So I set him down. I explained how this thing works. 
So this is the darnest thing. I mean, that whistle blew so much at my house, it just about, it, I mean, the kids got into it. I mean, they blew the whistle. He took my toy. I don't want to hear it. Oh, <laughs> to the whistle they go. It got absolutely crazy. But you know what? It worked. It worked for me and my wife. It really did work. And it was amazing to us. It was amazing to us the stupidity of staying out of fellowship when it was so easy to get back. And getting back was so much better. There was so much more joy and peace and everything that comes from being in fellowship rather than in darkness, being in the light. It was so much better. But it just shows you. I mean, I'm just, I would, I'm just that kind of a guy, I guess. I mean, just put a whistle on the wall and I kind of learn theology. <laughs> it's not a, I'm not a quick learner, apparently. Uh, three. But that's rebound. Confess your sin quickly. Get back. Walk in, walk in fellowship. Walk in the light. Get out of darkness. Nothing good happens in darkness. Nothing good. Not after midnight. That's, I've heard that. <laughs> You must, did my mother, you, you, you must know my mother. Three, I'd say, why do I have to be in a minute? Because nothing good happens after. <laughs> did you grow up with that? No, no, down here you went, you went to bed early. Three, the superiority, the superiority of the new covenant blood of Christ sanctifies every church age believer at the moment of grace salvation, both for time and eternity. In Hebrews 10, we will see in verses 9 through 12, then he said, behold, I have come to do your will. That's a Psalms 40, verse 7. He takes away the first in order to establish the second, old covenant, new covenant. By this will, see, behold, I've come to do your will. See, he's talking about I've come to do the will of the Father. By this will, we have been sanctified because Jesus did the will of God by going to the cross. We have received sanctification being set aside unto the holiness of God in Christ we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins but he having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time sat down at the right hand of God the Father in heaven that session by one offering, listen, by one offering in, in the 10th chapter, verse 14, by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Boy, there's your eternal salvation. There's your eternal salvation, people. Same thing in the 13th chapter, verse 12, point four. The superiority of the blood of Christ brings grace salvation package of 50 things. To every church age believer, you can never lose in time and eternity. Ephesians 1.17 calls it redemption. Uh, almost all the writers call this package redemption. However, it's much bigger than that. In him, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. You know, that redemption in Colossians 1.13.14 that redemption is explained by rescuing you from Adam and, and transferring you into the kingdom of God. That's that, that's that redemption uh, program. Uh, Romans 3, 24 through 25, being justified as a gift by grace through redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through Faith, not works. Faith. The work was done by Jesus on the cross that you could receive it by, by faith, the package of grace redemption. Romans 5, 9, much more than having been justified by his blood, we have been saved from the wrath of God through him. See, that's at John three thirty six. Here's the fifth thing about the blood of Christ and why it's superior. The blood of Christ brings every church age believer into peace with God through reconciliation into the unity of the body of Christ, the church. Boy, that's a powerful idea, people. Peace with God. The moment 
because listen, you've been alienated. 13, you know, the 13 uh, judicial charges of Adam sent upon all people, alienated, under the raft, all of that business. See? Peace with God, peace with God. All that 13 judicial, all that, that hostility and stuff that was there positionally in Adam, in your life, all removed. And what you've been given in his place is peace with God. Peace with God. Listen, you may not be at peace with yourself, but you are at peace with God. Listen, God says, I'm at peace with you. You were under my wrath before then because of Adam's sin. Now you're under my peace. That's a very important idea. That's very important. Um, that's a that, for example, that's Romans five. I don't know if it's on your paper or not, but that's Romans five one and two. Is it there? Okay, I didn't know if I put it. And all these other passages. Uh, here's Acts twenty twenty eight. Be on guard for yourself and for all the flock. Talking to pastors among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So shepherd, pastor, so shepherd, pastor, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Listen, up, watch this now. Be on guard for yourself. Be on guard for yourself, men of God. Be on guard for yourself and be on guard for the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer, shepherd or pastor, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Who purchased it? He did. <coughs> pastor, the flock is his. You're to pastor them. That's also Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Is that on your paper? Yes. Oh, good. I'm so good to you people. And now in Christ Jesus, watch this. You know a great study for you? Sometime take your concordance, the back of your Bible, and look up everything that talks about your former, your former life. And it's a reminder to Christians, your former life shouldn't be present. The question is, how are you going to get rid of it? Your former life should be there. You've been saved from it. But it's still operating in your life. Say, that's what I found. I put the whistle on the wall. And that, listen, that thing worked until I had enough savvy spiritual capacity in my soul to be able to deal with this issue without a whistle. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly, formerly far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. That's one of 13 charges which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, Old Covenant, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both into one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. So when we come to the Eucharist, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, 17, he says, is not the cup of blessing? Now look at, listen, do you hear what he called it? He called it the cup of blessing. You know why? Because of salvation in Christ. It, the, what is in the cup? The blood of Christ, right? Yeah. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? That's a question, a rhetorical and the answer is, of course, is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we are, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in the body of Christ, the church. See? 
That's, we call that the Eucharist. And so there it is. I mean, how important is the blood of Christ? Ooh, I'm telling you. It is the key. It is the key of the new covenant. There, without he, the blood of Christ is where his, he is the mediator of the new covenant because of the blood of Christ. And that's everything. And so there's, what, five points on it, on the blood of Christ and how important that is. Well, let's close in a word of prayer and then we'll have our church time of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for this study, the superiority of the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the new covenant. In this church, we celebrate it every first Sunday of the month. We're told as often as you do it, you do it a certain way, and that's the way we do it. Doesn't mean we're right, just means that's what we've chosen as often as you and so, Father, we thank you for these that have come our way to study with us tonight and why we study the way we study is to try to bring the scriptures into the dynamics of their faith life to extend it categorically out there where they can put some walking shoes on it to show the dynamics and importance of the blood of Christ tonight and how it affects our life in time and eternity. Encourage our hearts to study, Father, under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and walk it out in our life under the power of the Holy Spirit and not the flesh. For we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ who knew no sin, be sin for us.